decisions are something that people make a million of every day. Uh huh. I I'm often uh, reminded of when I learned. I don't even remember when this was, but I learned about the concept of decision fatigue at some point Ugh. through that like science th- that there's there's like some study of like Soviet refugees that came to America or something uh, about grocery stores mm-hmm. and like the idea of having like 40 kinds of toothpaste instead of one just being like the most exhausting thing that any of those people had ever contemplated. Yeah. And I, I think of that in my work creating and designing experiences for people, digital experiences for people, most of all, as an increasing number of the decisions that people have to make are made on the same device as the decisions that I'm asking them to make. I'm trying to reduce the number of decisions. Right. Right. Does that, does that describe your work in any kind of overarching way? Oh, a hundred percent. And it's funny because now that you put it that way, that is exactly it. It reminds me of, um, what immediately came to mind is when I was working, um, prim- uh, when I was working at an agency pri- that primarily had higher education clients, um, just the most horrific sprawling websites mm. you've ever seen in your life with, um, 10,000 plus pages, like not even me using that number as an yeah. exaggeration. Right. right? Um, and so I wouldn't necessarily have used the term decision fatigue, but this is what it is mm-hmm. when I was always trying to tell my clients about the productivity of clicks, like stop talking to me about the fewest clicks possible. Mm. And like, oh, this needs to be one click away from the homepage. And this should be no more than two clicks. Like, let's think about productive clicks. Because like, yes, technically, your item, um, a classic thing that I was always taking down was uh, I would get to the website and they would have like, state university a to z and you would go to this page and it would be an alphabetized list of every page on their website Mm -hmm. and that's one click from the home page so yes anything is only two clicks from the home page but i'd be like yes but someone just had to sift through all of that because you couldn't just let them click through three instead to let them make fewer decisions i don't even (laughs) want to ask how the alphabetically sorted list was maintained whether there was any sort of automated process for indexing. Oh, no, absolutely not. Some intern had to go type it in in the right place in the alphabet, right? Yes, yeah. (laughs) So I actually did a talk about this at um, like a web marketing conference for people in higher ed web um, that was about like rescuing their sitemaps. And that was two of the things I talked about were those A to Z pages or like the triple menu bar where you get like, the main menu that has like a really skinny gray strip at the top that has a bunch of links. And then like you have your main menu and then under that you have all of these things or the A to Z page. And like, sometimes you'd get those A to Z pages where they'd be like, Oh, like we did a level of curation. So you don't necessarily need to know what a program is called because we've put five names for that program in the five different alphabetical slots on this page, but we haven't updated this page in two years and that program actually doesn't exist anymore (laughs) anyway. So like, good luck. Yeah. And, and, and there's no, it's much like the alphabetical order thing. Like there's no undoing that because if you've created like seven different ways, like esoteric ways of getting to the same content and then that Mm -hmm. content changes, you're never going to remember what all of the things are that you have to undo in order to make it work a different way now. Exactly. People love like people in admin or, or just in general, like when you're trying to like decide how to sort some stuff, you're like, Oh yeah, you do it alphabetically, but you don't, you don't hang your hat. Like you don't go out into the world and like wayfind via alphabet. (laughs) <laughs> like that's not how right. your brain lodges information. So you do this thing because it seems like a handy, um, you know, a political organization system. Yes. And now you've just made it 10 times harder to remember anything. So we, we, it's, it's not surprising to me that we have, you and I getting together to talk about this have fallen directly into the seventh circle of hell of the kinds of problems <laughs> that people encounter. But I, I think that they, or create for themselves. But I, I think that, that, 
probably anybody who's ever tried to do anything on a website before, let alone anyone who's ever had to try to organize information about an organization or institution before, uh, is, is recognizing the kind of problem we're talking about here. Uh, I want to try and zoom out to figure out what the, what the human being level problem is that people are like the mistake that people are making that, that isn't translating to like, an understandable experience for the person that they're nominally supposed to be helping make decisions. The, the, the way that I tend to describe the institutional hell website jobs that I've had to do, um, uh, to summarize what was wrong with all of them across all the like nonprofit and government and, and, you know, media industry websites that I've worked on. The problem is always best summed up for me as re recreating the org chart. Mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. that like the people who want this website are thinking about themselves and their own status hierarchies and their own power relative to one another. And that's what they want a website about their thing to recreate, to represent, to like put the mm -hmm. right people at the top of the pyramid basically. Uh, and, yep. and they don't care. There's like a, so many problems with this. One is the one that we've already covered where like they don't care how that hierarchy is is maintained over time what they want is to ship the website that their executives ask them to ship that has them at the top of the pyramid and then once that's over like who cares um but the thing the main thing that i think they don't understand and this is sort of the general human problem that i want you to ask you about is that they mm -hmm. aren't doing that what, what they're doing is not has no psychology of visitors right. whatsoever why why do you think that is so difficult to understand for people <laughs> who are trying to create a communication tool that what they what the communication has someone on the receiving end. I feel like it's a spiritual problem. Yeah, I like, think so too. <laughs> you you're so focused in like because so the org chart is like your worldview that like you're yes. projecting on this thing. Yes. And it is so hard to just, you know, swap your brain around to someone coming at it from a completely different angle from you. And even if you're someone who knows that intellectually, it's still so difficult. And like, you can talk about, um, oh, I'm going to do user research, but then you try to help someone like distill a question down to not be leading. Um, but they'll still do like, a, oh, well, what do you think about? And what do you, like, it's not, it's so hard to get like an accurate picture of someone else's mental model because you're just not them. And it's like, how much are you able or not able to set your own ego aside mm -hmm. to think about how someone else comes at the problem? Um, one thing I've seen a lot is like, so maybe you're getting a client who agrees that, okay, yes, we're not structuring the site around the org chart because a high schooler isn't going to understand the org chart. But then they want to structure it around like, oh, when people call me and ask me this question because they can't find the information, this is the problem they have or this is where I tell them to go. So we should do it this way. And they think that that's user research because someone's calling and like asking that that question. But I'm like, someone's asking that question because your stuff is set up a certain way, yeah. not because that's how they want to find it. Like there's just layers and layers and layers of yeah. people's cognition that you, is so tough to fe peel apart. <laughs> I feel like you've hit sort of the second level of the problem and it what it, what it calls to mind to me is how is what has made some of my website clients better than others at uh bad ia <laughs> which, yes. which, yes. which is which is and and the ones who are better meaning meaning like the, they have like an okay ish idea of what they want to do that i have to fix as opposed to an utterly abominable idea and and mm -hmm. the one that the, the difference is often made by the amount of the organization devoted to support because yes, because yes. if you understand mm -hmm. as a business already that support burden 
is a problem to solve, you are all you're you're ready to start thinking about a website as like a proactive way of helping people solve their own problems instead of calling you. And yes. and that's like a good start to understanding that like people coming to your website have like workflows that they're going through and you you understand them because you understand how they have failed if yes. they get through by by yeah. getting by con- having to contact support but what you what you're saying is e- in, even even if you get that far like there's still like a like a block like a lack of awareness of like how I could have solved that problem for someone before they needed support in the first place exactly so so what do you do next with with a with a client who's in this position so my first answer is argue, argue with them a, a lot. <laughs> yes. Um, gently, very gently. Yes. Um, it's because it's not always, sometimes they don't realize they're having an argument with me. Like I try to make that be like one of my client specialties because yes. I, and I think this is where my like magical practice ends up helping me with my like website practice because nice. I can really sort of like ground myself and explore where they're coming from to try and like feedback that back at them. You know what I mean? So, but it's, it, the thing that kind of like sucks a little bit about it is it can kind of fundamentally come down to what kind of person your client is and how much they're willing to learn from you or not. And like Mm. be open to that because especially when you're working, the bigger the institution gets and the bigger the system you're working with, the more people you're working with and the more chances for someone who's not willing to be open-minded about the process to like kind of come in and blow the thing up. Yes, There is one client I can think of who I worked on their website probably eight years ago now. And the information architecture that I built for them is actually still intact. They are the single only client out of probably 40 schools that I've worked on that five plus years on, it's still intact. And Mm -hmm. I would say that's because their admin was the most, it wasn't even necessarily the smallest admin. It was just a staff of people who were all very oriented to the project, very curious, very interested in learning. It's it's, what strikes me is that there's a difference between internally created problems to solve and people who is solving their like people outside who you exist to solve problems for what's important is like people want the quantitative because it's really easy evidence and you feel like you can gather a lot of it right and then when you make the decision you feel like you're not making it about like an ambiguous decision even though you actually are but like you can trick yourself so like you need to be comfortable with coming down and making an executive decision with still some level of ambiguity and knowing like I'm doing this on intuition. So this client was great because they actually paid for a ton of user research um, at every phase of the project. Um, We did so much research with um, their community, with their prospective students, with their current students. And we did this um, prototype test Um, for their program pages of, um, it was like, so the different medical programs, um, and I'm trying to remember exactly like how I had kind of had them laid out before, but basically I spoke to just five current students at the school and five is a really scary number to clients because they're like, that doesn't seem like that much, but and here I'm going with the with the quantitative, but like studies have shown again and again that after when you're doing qualitative research, after five to eight people, you start getting like wicked diminishing returns. Mm, mm. So all of these students said to me and like blessedly because of the culture they were in, they were very honest. They were like, this is great information that you've like put on this demo program page. And they were like, this is what I saw. But like, to be perfectly honest, like, to start, I just wanted to get into metal, medical school. They were like, they didn't put it this way, but everyone was like, I don't actually give a shit about any of this until I find out where I'm actually accepted. Because they were like, it is so hard to get into medical school that I'm just like, they were like, we're spraying spaghetti at a wall. We'll see where we get in. And then 
we'll come back and we'll do research about some of the more like um, touchy feely is not the word I want, but more of like the cultural aspects of the school. So mm -hmm. they were like, when I get here, I want to know like the program's ranking, like some basics about the class, blah, blah, blah. And they were like, put that first and then I will come back. So it like completely put the structure of on its head. Um, and the client was like, you know what? Yes. Okay. Let's do it. Mm. Like we completely redid their design work based on what these five students said. And it came out fantastic and it was clearly successful because I've seen them launch new programs since that used the same thing, but they had to trust us mm -hmm. <laughs> about what we were saying about qualitative feedback um, and kind of go with that gut decision because there's no, like, like it's not like I could give a metric that like, 50% more potential applicants felt 70% more comfortable applying, uh -huh, <laughs> you know, right. because it's all feelings. Right. Um, so you really just have to like sink into it and, and be okay with it and then decide how much you trust the professional. Cause they would have been fair to say like, no, we already did all this work on this page and you're saying bullshit, you know? Would you say that a fair summary of what you helped them do was understand what the most important decision was that their visitors had to make and that once they understood what it was, they they knew which decision they wanted that person to make and so they figured out how to make it easier. Totally. Yeah, and I, the thing that was great about it too was it also let them think of their site a little bit more as like a repeat destination and like how can they welcome someone back and be in conversation, right? So like... It's, it's not like people will think about one-off metrics, but like, you know, if you do a good job for them, they'll remember and like, they'll come back to find out the next thing they need and then the next thing. So like, how can we then, you know, guide them and make it a really comfy place? When, when you have a, an IA, an information architecture for a website that you have been like taking apart and putting back together over and over again, piece by piece for as long as it takes to do that. And then you finally get an overarching structure that you know is correct. How do you know? It just sits hmm. like I've got to just, I've got to just trust it. At some point you got to be done. You got to decide to be done. <laughs> sure. So is that to say there is no right answer uh, there is only there is only answers that help enough. Yeah, yeah. And honestly, if I'm feeling woozy between like two, if I'm really not sure, like maybe don't tell my corporate clients this, but will I pull out a Lenormand deck about it? Yes, absolutely. Uh -huh. <laughs> and then I'll be done. <laughs> so you're saying you just have to make a decision. You have to make the decision. I have to make a decision. And sometimes like the divine is the only way of knowing whether a decision that you have to make is, is the, uh, is the one that aligns with the decisions that will be made as a result. Yeah. Sometimes you just like have to let go and let God, even if it's a business school's information architecture. 